530 Command, this is Risky 37. I am on the end of what used to be Whitman Road, or where it has been washed out. Within hours after the rain-soaked hillside above Steelhead Haven collapsed, the enormity of the disaster was now coming into focus. Guys, at my vantage point up here at the end of Whitman, the river is completely blocked. But initially, there's confusion among first responders. Can you give me uh, a little detail on the Steelhead Drive? Amanda Siddharth and Baby Duke were rescued on the west side of the slide, closer to Oso. But firefighters from Darrington, 10 miles up the road, are also inbound, making rescues farther to the east on Highway 530. In radio traffic, you begin to hear the moments they realize the full scale of the debris field between them. Uh, I cannot see Steelhead Drive at this point. It's on the other side of the slide. I think it was quickly determined they were well over a mile apart at that point. And then it's like, okay. That's Darrington Fire Chief Joel Johnson. He started at the Oso Department just a few weeks before the landslide. At what point did you know this was more than just a little slide block in the road? You could start hearing on the voices between, um, you know, the, the responding units from Oso and the responding units from Darrington. And you could kind of hear it in their voice like, well, where are you? We don't see you. We don't, you know, kind of back and forth, back and forth. And all of a sudden you kind of realize, well, if they're not able to see or make connection to each other physically, this is much bigger than any of us realized. This is part two in the story of the Oso landslide, the deadliest landslide in U.S. history. Forty-three people died when a hillside above Oso, Washington suddenly collapsed on March 22, 2014. The event forever changed the lives of so many, including families who lost loved ones, first responders, rescuers, even the journalists that covered the traumatic events day after day, like myself and many of my colleagues. In this podcast series, we're sharing stories about what happened, why it happened, and how the tragedy reshaped the community forever. I'm Jake Wittenberg with King 5 News. This is Ozo. Uh, I think we're looking at a catastrophic event here. Uh, we've got Whitman Road that has been taken out by a slide. Uh, the river is backing up. If there was any good fortune that day, it was that a helicopter team with the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office was already gathered for a routine Saturday training mission that made their response to the Oso landslide incredibly fast. We head up that valley pretty often, especially during rescue season. So we flew down to the slide area and overflew it. There was, we didn't see any, hardly any, we didn't see anybody on our first pass. We didn't see as much as a two by four, just mud, trees, debris. And I don't think any of us appreciated at that time that at that very location, there were, what was it, 20 some houses in there, I believe. Uh, Pilots Steve Klett, Bill Quistorf, and rescue tech Randy Fay have conducted countless rescue missions in their long careers but admit approaching the landslide debris field took their breath away. These bits and pieces start flowing into your head and you're trying to connect the dots if there's no water in the river. So we would cue off that community to make our turn and that community's gone. So there was momentary questions are, what's going on? Are we in the right place? There's this kind of panic setting in and the scale of this is starting to make sense, but you know, hey, we got work we have to do. We had our moving map so we could see we were right over the neighborhood and it was nothing um, man-made that we could see. The is completely covered from just beyond Skaglin Hill. Uh, we made one pass downstream over the pile and we didn't see anybody and we turned around and came back up and that's when we spotted the two ladies on the rooftop. It was Robin Youngblood and her friend Yeti Duper both covered in mud, shivering cold, and in desperate need of help. Youngblood's mobile home along the Stilaguamish had just been washed away by that tidal wave of mud. Robin and Jetty somehow swam to the surface and clung to the unattached roof of her mobile home. As I'm going down the hook, I realize that this, the roof section they're on is floating. We have a rescue device. It's kind of like a hammock thing that we, for a quick extraction that we'll put them in. That's when I started getting the whiff of all the propane too, plus the open septic systems. We're working in the middle of a lake, basically. Everything out there had exploded. And I had to get all the mud out of my nose and mouth and eyes and ears. And Ten years later, Robin can remember every detail of that rescue. 
like it was yesterday. The water was still coming in. The mud was still coming in. My house had been destroyed. I have her. Give me some slack. We got the Dutch woman up and out of there, came back down, hooked up Robin, and she's a Native American pastor, and she had a, a painting of this Indian warrior that she had lugged up to the roof. It was clearly meaningful for her, and I told her, you can't, you can't take that. But I told him, it's very important to me. It's a Cherokee night warrior. In body camera video captured during the rescue, you can see that Cherokee night warrior painting. It's large and difficult to carry, but Robin somehow salvaged it from the floods and it's covered in mud. I needed that painting. That's all I can say about it. I really needed it. So we got her up and when they came to extract me again, I just grabbed the painting and took it up with me. It was very satisfying to at least have that one piece of her life there to give to her. So I felt good about that after it was done. My colleague Greg Copeland traveled to North Carolina, where Robin lives today, about as far away from Oso as you can get. But she admits it's not the same. Well, how, how do we end up here? Basically, I've spent the last 10 years trying to find safety again. I miss the cedar trees. I miss the giant firs we had. The Oso tree was on the edge of our property and it was a 120 foot grand fir. 10 years later, Oso feels like a memory, but some days more like a nightmare that continues to haunt her. You know, I was under the mud in the water and everything was hitting me, all the furniture, Sometime in there, I blacked out, and I don't really even know how I found up. Will I ever be completely at peace? I don't know. I've been a warrior all my life. I've fought for so many different things. I had to fight my way out of that mudslide and through the next years. And maybe I'm still fighting a few things. I'm a walking miracle. There are so many others who died. I'm still here. How are you? How are you, John? Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. How are you? How are you? Good. John Pennington was the director of the Snohomish County Department of Emergency Management. The main thing for us is to continue to watch the hillside. By this time in his career, He'd coordinated the response for more than 30 disasters, but he says the Oso landslide was unlike anything he's ever experienced. I had a Blackberry device at that time, and I remember that little red dot blinking at me when I got out of the shower, and it was my um, duty officer for the week for Snohomish County's Department of Emergency Management, Mark Murphy, and his exact phrase was, I don't feel good about this. The river is completely blocked. We have homeowners trapped in a house and I don't know how long this blockage is going to hold. Every minute that went by, more details were coming in. At what point did you know this was going to be a massive catastrophe? Fairly quickly. The reports that were coming in from our, the air assets in Snohomish County were that that community was effectively and unfortunately gone. We had someone saying, uh, you know, law enforcement that would say, you know, we, we see a slide, we think it's maybe 300 yards wide, 400 yards long. On the other side of the slide, a similar picture, 300 yards deep, you know. I mean, it was just, we were hearing different things. But At this point, it was still not known exactly how many lives were lost or how many others may still be trapped. Pennington began the unprecedented coordination of every available crew by land and by air in western Washington. And I mean, we just got a hold of, uh, we're calling Navy for a second helicopter. He also began to alert grief counselors that they would need to deal with any trauma caused by this mass casualty event. It had rained something like 22 inches in 22 days. And here we had um, suddenly a lake that was backing up and winding its way upstream towards Darrington. I recommend whatever manpower we have to start evacuating from the 
on the upstream side of the slide. Uh, one of the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make in emergency management, a state uh, hydrogeologist contacted me and said that he was right near or at the slide and that it was going to, in his words, break loose and destroy everything in its path, basically all the way down towards Stanwood. That was a game changer for all of the crews involved. His team prepared to send out an emergency bulletin in the form of what's called a reverse 911 call. It's a way to alert a large number of people over a wide area that disaster could soon strike. Okay, but one thing that we need to possibly do is have snowpack do a reverse 911 in case this thing lets loose and floods downstream. It was moments later when Pennington says he got an unexpected phone call. A conflicting phone call from, in this case, Ted Beener of the National Weather Service, somebody that I'd worked with for years, just literally minutes prior to pushing the button to evacuate the whole remainder of the Stilly Valley. And he asked me the question, he says, John, he said, how are you? I said, I'm okay, tough, tough day. I said, what can I do for you? He said, how long have we known each other? I said, a long time, 10, 15, 20 years. He says, do you trust me? Absolutely. He said, um, I'm letting you know it's, it's not gonna happen, that the river beds were empty, you don't have to evacuate in the way that maybe you're thinking about it. And it helped us to make better decisions that day, but it shows you the range of emotions that we were running through just in that one decision of 10,000. Broken arm, broken ankle with a heavy laceration. By play. nightfall on day one, around a dozen people had been rescued from the pile, and it was still believed dozens more could still be missing in the pile of mud and debris. But darkness forced rescue crews to pause and pray until morning. Still to come. It was like a scene out of a horrible movie. It was horrendous. More than a thousand people and every available search dog in the country join in the search effort, but hope it's fading fast. You're gonna have a victory if you get something out of life. Day after day, rescuers comb through the landslide looking for any signs of life, while others are forced to grieve the loss of their family. Gene was asking where her family was. I don't have answers for him. That's tomorrow in Oso, life after the deadliest landslide in U.S. history.